my heart was cold, lukewarm was I, when lo, I heard the midnight cry. I love to echo still that cry, behold the heavenly bridegroom's I'm a pilgrim and I'm a stranger. I can tarry, I can tarry but a night. If the public will countenance such a quack pretender in his efforts to excite the minds of ignorant, superstitious people, they, as well as he, should bear the responsibility. The Republican Herald. We must speak out, and we will. These men are the worst enemies of God. The Olive Branch. The Second Advent delusion has proved the greatest calamity that has befallen us since our organization. General Convention of Baptists, 1846. When I look back, to the period when we began to publish the news of a coming savior. I think it the happiest time of my life. The glorious appearing of Christ is my only hope. To this I cling. William Miller. On the 22nd of October in 1844, as tradition has it, a group of people stood or sat expectantly from morning to night on a large rock ledge in a place then called Low Hampton, New York. Nearby in the front room of a farmhouse, a 62-year-old itinerant Baptist preacher sat reading a Bible and praying. These people, and perhaps hundreds of thousands more, from Portland, Maine to St. Louis to Washington, D.C., were called Millerites. Some had sold or given away all their possessions in the preceding days. Others had left crops standing in the field. They had eaten what they thought was their last meal on earth. They and William Miller, the man in the farmhouse, were waiting quietly for the end of the world. Eighteen forty four. John Tyler, U.S. President since 1841, lost his own party's nomination to run in the fall election. The U.S. Senate rejected a bid by the Republic of Texas to join the Union. Samuel Morris, a prominent portrait painter and inventor, tapped out his famous first telegraph message for members of Congress. What hath God wrought? Pioneer spirited Americans had begun to surge west along routes becoming famous as the Oregon and Santa Fe Trails. Back east, new factories roared with cheap labor pouring in from Europe and cheap cotton streaming in from the south. While most of the rest of the world had loosed the chains of slavery, America, it seemed, forged them tighter and tighter. In Europe, Karl Marx met Frederick Engels for the first time. Alexander Dumas published The Count of Monte Cristo. George Williams founded the YMCA. And 1844 mark the culmination of one of the most remarkable episodes in the history of modern religion. It's difficult to calculate how many people actually believed or hoped or perhaps feared that the world would end that year. <laughs> 
Serious estimates range from 100,000 to a million, or on the high end, one in every 17 Americans. For 13 years, Americans had been outraged or inspired by the startling message of William Miller. For nine of those years, his doctrine had smoldered quietly through the tiny hamlets and small towns of Vermont and upstate New York. By 1844, it raged in the public consciousness of the nation. In 1835, Charles Grandison Finney, the greatest revivalist preacher of the age, wrote, If the church would do her duty, the millennium may come in this country in three years. The late 18th century and early 19th century was a time of boundless enthusiasm. The enlightenment of the 18th century came up with the doctrine that humanity was infinitely perfectible, and the new nation of the United States gave a promise to that with the boundless frontier where people, if they just tried hard enough, they could accomplish almost anything. The millennium refers to the thousand years at the end of time that had been anticipated by Christians since the beginning of the Christian era. The millennium could be conceived of as a specifically religious event associated with the return of Jesus Christ, and many people in the 1820s, 1830s, and 1840s thought of it in that way. On the other hand, many people during that time also thought in terms of a simple anticipation of a better future, a future of more peace, more justice, more prosperity, in a more secularized sense. By the middle of the 1840s, most Americans believed that their nation was leading the world into a great golden age. The Industrial Revolution ran at full throttle. During the previous quarter century, the powered textile mill, the cotton gin, the steamboat, the opening of the Erie Canal, and the development of the railroad all had promised a great new era for the country and for humanity. With the new technology came wonders hardly dreamed before. Trips that took days could be completed in hours. Canal barges could float where boats had never floated before. Passenger ships could sail easily upstream and down. And freight could move on rails of iron at 30 miles an hour. Mill towns in the north, like Lowell, Massachusetts, became models of organization in the new capitalism. Cotton, heavily dependent on slave labor, became a pillar of the American economy and furtively set the stage for America's most wrenching future crisis. At the same time, Americans matched their industrial and economic progress with a passion for perfecting the inner human spirit. Masses of them had decided that the imminent golden age could be hastened if they just worked a little harder at it. Reform became the catchword of a generation. There was no social ill, it seemed, that could not be cured. Reformers and crusaders were everywhere, forming societies, publishing newspapers, advocating causes, founding charities, sending missionaries. The easiest targets of the great moral crusades were slavery and alcohol. Boston's inflammatory young radical William Lloyd Garrison published the first issue of The Liberator in 1831 and sparked a massive and often contradictory movement in the North to abolish or at least do something about the South's so-called peculiar institution. On the temperance front, over 6,000 societies had sprung up by 1833 each seeking to reverse the path of the drunkard. Charismatic leaders founded utopian communities in an effort to create local heavens on earth through new social arrangements. By the 1840s, the Shakers had built two dozen communities with 6,000 adherents. Other communities sprang up including New Harmony in Indiana, Brook Farm near Boston, and Oneida in central New York. Bronson Alcott, father of author Louisa May, attempted a brief but celebrated experiment at Fruitlands in the town of Harvard, Massachusetts. New religious groups also flourished during the fertile period, each claiming the best understanding of ultimate truth to introduce the perfect life. Most notable were the Mormons under the leadership of their young prophet Joseph Smith. Meanwhile, more traditional religion with a new twist was booming again. Frontier camp meetings and high-pitched preaching caught up thousands of new converts into the Methodist, Baptist, and Presbyterian churches. The intellectual centers of the East caught on fire, too, 
At Yale, where deism and skepticism were popular, college president Timothy Dwight inspired a religious revival that swept the campus in 1802. More revivals followed at Yale and other colleges. Students realized that intellectuals they respected could also believe in revealed religion. Those who were converted to Christianity and joined the ministry during those great revivals carried what became known as the Second Great Awakening into the 1830s. They defined the course of American religion for the next 100 years. The Second Great Awakening of traditional Christianity in the early 19th century originated as a reaction against deism and the rationalist philosophy that had dominated the revolutionary period. Deists like Ben Franklin and Thomas Jefferson had largely limited their faith to a supreme being who created the universe and then pretty much left it alone. They denied the divine inspiration of the Bible, the sinful nature of man, the need for a personal savior and God's personal intervention in human affairs. To traditional churchgoers, it sounded remarkably like rank atheism, and they fought back. The unfolding horrors of the French Revolution provided Orthodox Protestants with their best argument against deism and its inevitably demoralizing effects as they saw it. Another good argument came in 1798 when Napoleon's troops entered the Vatican, arrested Pope Pius VI and sent him to exile in France. Many Protestants saw the great event as proof that the Bible, contrary to deist philosophy, was the inspired prophetic word of God. Ever since Martin Luther, Protestants had maintained that the papacy was the antichrist of biblical prophecy in the books of Daniel and Revelation. As they read them, those books said that a great power, or antichrist, would persecute God's people for 1260 prophetic days and then receive a deadly wound. These 1260 days were generally understood to mean 1260 literal years, the very length of time the Roman Church had dominated Western civilization. Thus, the capture of the Pope, in their view, was an obvious direct fulfillment of prophecy. Interest in prophetic interpretation boomed on both sides of the Atlantic. In addition to the 1260-year prophecy, scholarly attention focused on the cryptic 2300-day or year prophecy in the 8th chapter of Daniel which pointed to a cleansing of the sanctuary. By the mid-1830s, more than 75 scholars, writers, and commentators on three continents had published views predicting that the 2300 prophetic days or years of Daniel 814 would end, and the mysterious cleansing of the sanctuary would occur sometime in the 1840s. Knowing when those years would end was one thing. Knowing how they would end was quite another. There was a shared sense of anticipation that something great was coming in the 1840s, but Americans differed about what that event or what that thing that was coming might be. A number of Christians, for example, believed in the post-millennial theory that the great age of peace and prosperity would come first introduced by human action. Miller, on the other hand, believed that the earth would burn and Jesus Christ would return before the thousand years of peace and prosperity. The difference between Miller and the larger culture was not that he expected the millennium. Rather, it's what he expected to happen at the beginning of the millennium and during the millennium. Whereas the popular culture of the day saw the millennium as a thousand years of peace and plenty, Miller saw it as a breakthrough of the divine into human history, that is, the second coming of Jesus Christ in the clouds of heaven. I can find nothing in the Word of God to warrant me to believe that we ought to look for or expect a happier period than we now enjoy. Until he who has promised to come shall come the second time and cleanse us, the world, and make all things new. These things are abundantly proved in the unerring Word of God. William Miller. Miller's message took hold all across the Northeast, from tiny country churches to the great meeting halls of big city America. And by the autumn of 1844, there were few Americans who didn't know that the Millerites had finally named the day. Christ would return in glory to claim his people, and the earth would be destroyed by fire on October 22, 1844.
Our curiosity was recently gratified by an introduction to this gentleman, who has probably been an object of more abuse, ridicule, and blackguardism than any other man now living. A large number of the voracious editors of the political and religious newspapers have assured us that Mr. Miller was totally insane. We were somewhat surprised to hear him converse on religious subjects with a coolness and soundness of judgment which made us whisper to ourselves, If this be madness, then there is method in it. Gazette and Advertiser Miller was a Yankee born in 1782 on the western edge of New England. A short time later, his family established a farm in a place called Lowhampton, a half mile across the Vermont border into New York near the southern end of Lake Champlain. Religion played a strong role in Miller's boyhood. A grandfather and an uncle were Baptist ministers. I spent much time in trying to invent some plan whereby I might please God when brought into his immediate presence. Two ways suggested themselves to me, which I tried. One was to be very good, to do nothing wrong, tell no lies, and obey my parents. But I found my resolutions weak and soon broken. The other was to sacrifice by giving up the most cherished objects I possessed. But this also failed me. William Miller. While yearning for spiritual peace, Miller also desperately longed for learning, a rare commodity in his area. He developed a passion for books, reading every one he could borrow from the few neighbors in the area affluent enough to have any and generous enough to lend them. In 1803, 21-year-old William Miller married Lucy Smith of Pulteney, Vermont, left Lowhampton and moved to Lucy's hometown. Pulteney opened a new world to Miller, a world of relative luxury where books were plentiful in homes and in the town's public library. It was a world of an educated citizenry and new ideas. Prominent citizens in Pulteney befriended the promising young man from across the river and exposed him to the popular deistic ideology of the day. Miller, however, already had his own doubts about the Bible, for what he believed were its blatant contradictions. I was exceedingly anxious to reconcile all its various parts and tried with all the means within my reach to do so. I was particularly anxious to have them harmonized by the preachers of the word, but I received from them no satisfaction. Miller's own questions and his rapid acceptance into an invigorating social circle in Pulteney strained his connection with his orthodox past. He wrestled with his belief. Come, blessed religion, with thy angel's face. Dispel this gloom and brighten all the place. Drive this destructive passion from my breast. Compose my sorrows and restore my rest. Show me the path that Christian heroes trod. Wean me from earth and raise my soul to God. After a short struggle, his doubts won out. Miller embraced deism. During the next decade, he joined the Masons. He became politically active and participated in the local debating society held in the upper floor of a schoolhouse. His farming ventures prospered. His townsmen elected him constable, sheriff, and justice of the peace. In the meantime, I continued my studies. The more I read, the more dreadfully corrupt did the character of man appear. I fondly cherished the idea that I should find one bright spot, at least in human character, as a star of hope, a love of country, patriotism. Miller joined the Vermont State Militia in 1810 as a lieutenant. Two years later, in 1812, when war broke out with Britain, Miller became captain of a company of Vermont volunteers. By September 1814, he was a captain in the U.S. Army stationed in Plattsburgh, New York. Nearby, the British had amassed a large naval and ground force on the Canadian border at the north end of Lake Champlain. Dear Lucy, the British are within ten miles of this place, and I think they must be damned fools if they do not attack us. 
as they are ten or eleven thousand strong, and we are only fifteen hundred. It may be my lot to fall. If I do, I will fall bravely. Remember, you will never hear from me if I am a coward. Remember your William Miller. When the battle opened on the morning of September 11, the odds were lopsided. 1,500 regular U.S. Army troops and 4,000 volunteers faced a seasoned British force of 15,000 regulars. Against three to one odds, the Americans won. Fort Scott, September 11, 1814, 20 minutes past 2 p.m. Sir, it is over. It is done. The British fleet has struck to the American flag. Great slaughter on both sides. My God, the sight was majestic. It was noble. It was grand. Three of my men are wounded by a shell which burst within two feet of me. I can write no more, for the time grows dubious. Yours forever, William Miller. The stunning upset at Plattsburgh caused Miller to re-examine his thinking about the role of God in the affairs of humanity. Many occurrences served to weaken my confidence in the correctness of deistical principles. At the commencement of the battle, we looked upon our defeat as almost certain. And yet, we were victorious. So surprising a result against such odds did seem to me like the work of a mightier power than man. After the war, Miller moved his family from Poultney back across the river to Lowhampton, New York, near his childhood home. He built a house and established a farm. He began showing up at the Baptist church on Sundays while being careful to make no pretense of belief. Because Miller read well in public, church members appointed him to read printed sermons to the congregation when the pastor was away. The readings touched his heart. He was reconverted to Christianity with membership in the Baptist Church. I was constrained to admit that the scriptures must be a revelation from God. They became my delight, and in Jesus I found a friend. The Savior became to me the chiefest among 10,000, and the scriptures, which before were dark and contradictory, now became the lamp to my feet and the light to my path. Though Miller had found his savior in the scriptures, he kept studying and began a two-year verse-by-verse examination of the entire Bible. This led him to the apocalyptic prophecies in the books of Daniel and Revelation, the same ones studied with great interest by many clergymen of the era. Using the standard principles of Bible interpretation accepted by the Protestant world for centuries, Miller, too, saw something significant predicted for the 1840s. He concluded that the prophecy of four successive world empires in the second and seventh chapters of Daniel had been literally and explicitly fulfilled. He further found, as others had, that Daniel predicted that 2,300 days would elapse between the command to restore and build Jerusalem after the Jewish captivity in Babylon and the cleansing of the sanctuary. Most historians agree that the command to rebuild Jerusalem took place in 457 B.C. And the prophecies say that 2,300 days would elapse between that event and the cleansing of the sanctuary. Biblical interpreters very often said that a day of prophetic time was equivalent to a year of chronological time. William Miller's particular contribution to American prophecy was his belief that the cleansing of the sanctuary would lead to the burning of the earth and the second coming of Christ. So to say when that happened, he simply had to subtract 457 from 2300 years, and that led to the year 1843. I was thus brought in 1818, at the close of my two years study of the scriptures, to the solemn conclusion that in about 25 years from that time, all the affairs of our present state would be wound up. Meanwhile, Miller's townsmen in Lowhampton, like those in Poultney a few years before, had elected him to post as sheriff and justice of the peace. He continued his Bible studies, wrestled with his rocky farm and with his conscience. If the world would end and Jesus would return in a few more years as he firmly believed, people ought to know about it ahead of time. When I was about my business, it was continually ringing in my ears, go and tell the world of their danger. Miller, however, resisted the call to preach. 
I told the Lord that I was not used to public speaking, that I was slow of speech and of a slow tongue, but I could get no relief. Able to endure the mental strain no longer, on a Saturday afternoon in August 1831, Miller made a covenant with God. If he received an unsolicited invitation to share his views publicly, he would take it as God's command to preach, and he would go. As the story goes, within half an hour, Miller's nephew arrived from nearby Dresden. His message was that the Baptist preacher there would be away. Would Miller please come and preach his Second Advent doctrines at the Dresden Baptist Church? Miller was immediately upset that he'd made such a promise. And according to his own recollections, he got so mad that he stomped out of the house out to a grove nearby and there he had a prayer session with God for about an hour before he could finally bring himself to humble himself and recognize that he could not break his promise to God. As soon as I commenced speaking, all my diffidence and embarrassment were gone, and I felt impressed with the greatness of the subject, which, by the providence of God, I was enabled to present. Well, the congregation was so excited about what he had to tell them that they invited him to stay during the week, and he gave a whole series of lectures. In fact, a revival ensued, and several families in the congregation were converted. When he got home, he found written invitations for him to come and preach to congregations also in Paulette, Vermont, and in Poultney, Vermont, where he had lived for several years after his marriage. It was the beginning of an entirely new career for the 49-year-old Justice of the Peace from the tiny village in upstate New York. It was a career that within a dozen years would make his name revered or reviled in virtually every corner of the nation. The churches are waking up in this quarter. I now have four or five ministers to hear me in every place I lecture in. I tell you, it is making no small stir in these regions. William Miller. By 1833, two years after his first public lectures, Miller had preached scores of lectures and dozens of speaking tours. He also had published his views in a series of 16 articles in a local weekly newspaper. Requests for his lectures in person and in print poured in. Well, Miller's ideas had wide popularity among all sorts of people, including country people who are relatively uneducated. But they also appealed quite strongly to the educated clergy, many of whom had seminary education and were ordained. This is surprising given the fact that no congregation or church had authorized Miller to preach publicly at all but soon he would receive that kind of authorization. Let brotherly love continue. The Baptist Church of Christ in Hampton and Whitehall do certify that Brother William Miller has been improving his gifts with us in expounding the words of divine truth. We are satisfied that Brother Miller has a gift to improve in public and are willing he should improve the same, that the name of the Lord may be glorified and his followers edified. Done in church meeting Saturday, September the 12th, 1833, by order of the church. Byron S. Harlow, clerk pro tem. My brethren have given me a license, unworthy and old and disobedient as I am. Oh, to grace how great a debtor. William Miller was now a licensed preacher. A few months later, a friend wrote to Miller addressing him as reverend. Dear Brother Hendricks, I wish you would look into your Bible and see if you can find the word reverend applied to a sinful mortal like myself and govern yourself accordingly. Let us be determined to live and die on the Bible. What care I for what the world calls great or honorable? Give me Jesus and a knowledge of his word, faith in his name, hope in his grace, interest in his love, and the world may enjoy all the high-sounding titles, the riches it can boast, the vanities it is heir to, and all the pleasures of sin, and they will be no more than a drop in the ocean. <laughs> 
Miller's speaking tours increased rapidly and coincided with the wave of popular revivalism encouraged by Charles Finney and a host of lesser imitators. But Miller had a different appeal than the typical evangelist of the Second Great Awakening. Miller was diametrically opposed in his evangelistic style to most of the revivalists of the day. Most revivalists aimed at the heart, well as Miller aimed at the head. Revivalists of the time are rightly remembered for their emotional appeals. William Miller, on the other hand, tended to balance his appeal between that emotional side, the anticipation of the end, and a more rational, fact-based appeal going to the evidence of scripture and history. Dear Brother Hendrix, lead your hearers by slow and sure steps to Jesus Christ. And where your hearers are not well indoctrinated, you must preach Bible. You must prove all things by Bible. You must talk Bible. You must exhort Bible. You must pray Bible and love Bible and do all in your power to make others love Bible too. In the fall of 1834, Miller went to preaching full-time. He resigned his office as Justice of the Peace in Lowhampton, turned his farm over to his sons, and began keeping a logbook of his travels and sermon texts. October 23, 1834. My dear brother Hendricks, your favor of September 17th came to hand while I was absent on a tour into Clinton County of about six weeks. I gave 36 lectures on the second coming of Christ, was at two covenant meetings, attended two protracted meetings, saw a number of newborn babes in Christ, and now, being at home, I shall write to Brother H and rest myself a little. William Miller. Cornwall, Bridgeport, Addison, Whiting, Hassock, Shoreham, Cambridge, Derby, Jericho, Eden, West Haven. Throughout 1835, Miller met request after request from small towns along the western edge of Vermont. He did the same on the New York side of Lake Champlain, in Granville, Middletown, Whitehall, Fort Anne, Middlebury, South Bay. Congregation after congregation, along with their pastors, turned out for his lectures, impressed by the logic of his argument and the power of his appeal. This may certify to whom it may concern that we, being ministers in the denomination of regular Baptists, are personally acquainted with Brother William Miller, that we have heard his lectures on the subject of the second coming and reign of our Lord Jesus Christ, and that we believe his views on that particular subject, as well as others pertaining to the gospel, are worthy to be known and read of all men. As such and one, we commend him to God, and the affectionate acceptance of our brethren in the precious Savior. J. Sawyer, Jr., South Reading. E. Helping, Hampton. By the middle of 1836, 42 ministers had signed the endorsement. In the street, in the house, in short, wherever, almost, you meet an individual, the first thing is, has Mr. Miller come yet? When is Mr. Miller going to be here? What is the reason he does not come? If the old gentleman can possibly come down to West Troy, I wish him to come as soon as possible. Reverend Frederick Park, March 12th, 1838. Dear Brother Miller, we want you to come to Rome immediately, the first Sunday if possible. Don't, I beg of you, make any delay or excuse, but come right off. Reverend Emerson Andrews, Rome, New York. In 1836 and again in 1838, William Miller published his lectures in a book entitled Evidence from Scripture and History of the Second Coming of Christ About the Year 1843. The book recently written by Reverend William Miller of Hampton, New York on the prophecies is destined, as we believe, to create a tremendous excitement in the Christian world. We know of nothing at the present time calculated to excite more deep and universal interest. George Roberts, editor, Boston Daily Times, March 13, 1838. The excerpts from Miller's book printed in an influential metropolitan newspaper brought Miller to the attention of Boston and other towns in eastern Massachusetts. 
And as with other causes, attention in Boston soon meant attention throughout the Northeast. In the spring of 1839, Miller made his first trip into Massachusetts. He went at the invitation of Timothy Cole, pastor of the Christian Connection Church in Lowell, Massachusetts. Cole set out to meet Miller at the train station. Cole waited with great enthusiasm as the train emptied, expecting to find a well-dressed gentleman who looked like the preacher he expected. But to his dismay, the only man left was both old and shaking with palsy. Cole was so discouraged that he even took Miller through the back door of his church, and when Miller got up to preach, Cole wouldn't go up on the platform with him. But after 15 minutes of hearing Miller preach, he went up and he supported him for the rest of the week through a series of meetings. At the end of that series, some 60 converts were baptized into the church. If I have ever seen a man that I believe is a true servant of God, sent by the Holy Spirit to proclaim the gospel of Christ, I consider William Miller to be that man, Timothy Cole. Timothy Cole became a Millerite. I shall speak again soon, but mean to know what I say and whereof I affirm. I am coming on, but when I come, look out, all my soul will be in it. Joshua Himes. In November of 1839, Miller met a 35-year-old pastor from Boston named Joshua Vaughn Himes. Himes was a minister of the loosely organized Christian Connection denomination, as well as pastor of Boston's Chardon Street Chapel. He invited Miller to Boston. Miller complied with two lecture series in December at Chardon Street and in February at the Marlboro Hotel Chapel. Himes wanted to know why so few people in the big cities knew much about Miller. Miller replied that he preached only where he was invited. I then told him he might prepare for the campaign, for doors should be opened in every city of the Union. Joshua Himes. Himes was born to a wealthy Episcopalian family in 1805. Unfortunately for Himes and the rest of the family, they lost their wealth when he was still a teenager. As a result, he was apprenticed out to a, be a cabinet maker, but at the age of 21, he started a career that led to a preaching ministry in the Christian Connection. During this middle period of his life, probably the most important thing that happened is that he became active in every, just about every reform of the time. Himes was what people in the 19th century would have called an enthusiast or an ultraist. He uh, was associated with the radical abolitionist William Lloyd Garrison, and like Garrison, he joined in a number of radical reform movements, not just abolitionism, but also women's rights, non-resistance, and other causes. At a very early period, he avowed himself an abolitionist and has been a faithful supporter of the anti-slavery movement, never ashamed to show his colors, never faltering in the darkest hour of its history. William Lloyd Garrison. In the end, though Himes gave up on the reforms to bring in the millennium, he saw Millerism as the ultimate reform, the bringing in of the kingdom of God through the second coming of Jesus. Within two months after hosting Miller's lectures at Chardon Street, Himes launched a weekly newspaper. He called it The Signs of the Times. Well, Joshua Himes was one of the first of the modern promoters. He was a little bit like P.T. Barnum in that regard. He knew how to take the, the modern newspapers, the dailies of the day, and, and he knew how to put pamphlets on canal boats and packet boats and in railroad stations. And he knew how to take a, a small regionalized phenomenon like Millerism and turn it into a big mass movement. As Miller's publicist, Himes took an aggressive stance. He would publish within his newspapers the attacks on Miller, and he would refute those arguments directly within the newspapers as well. Reverend Parsons Cook of Lynn, Mass., asserts in The Puritan that Mr. Miller's lectures are more demoralizing than the theater. We should be pleased to hear from those societies with whom Mr. Miller has lectured. Will they tell us, please, if this charge is true? Joshua Himes. Answers came from all over New England as the frenetic pace of Miller's travels, now orchestrated by Himes, picked up. The audiences were very large, notwithstanding it was a time of great excitement. Yet our place of worship was still as death. His lectures were delivered in the most kind and affectionate manner. 
A deep solemnity pervaded the minds of the community. All paused and pondered on the things they heard, inquiring, Am I ready? Elder Columbus Green, Colchester, Vermont. The great excitement referred to by Columbus Green as a contrast to Miller's meetings was the presidential election frenzy blowing in the autumn of 1840. It was the first of America's media elections. It confirmed the power of the penny press to shape public opinion. At the same time, Himes was moving Miller's campaign into high gear, using similar methods for what he viewed as the greatest of all causes. The politicians of this age have spent millions of silver and gold to elevate a man to the presidency of these United States. Shall we not pour out our treasures to give the slumbering church and world the news of the approach and reign of our eternal king? Joshua Himes. I am sorry that Himes has become the victim of an absurd theory, but I still regard him as a sincere and worthy man. William Lloyd Garrison. Throughout the spring, summer, and early autumn of 1840, Miller traveled almost nonstop throughout New York and New England, giving hundreds of lectures and winning the minds and hearts of his listeners. When every seat in the house was full and the platform and places about the pulpit seemed overcrowded, I have seen him leave the desk and walk down the aisle and take some feeble old man or woman by the hand and find a seat for them, then return and resume his discourse. He was indeed rightly called Father Miller, for he had a watchful care over those who came under his ministrations. Ellen Harmon. Ellen Harmon, the daughter of a Portland hat maker, Robert Harmon, was 12 years old when she first heard William Miller preach. Scores of ministers began reporting to the signs of the times mass revivals, conversions, and baptisms in the villages and cities where Miller preached. Many of those pastors and converts were also convinced that Miller was right about the second coming. They wanted to join something larger than a subscription list to a weekly newspaper. They needed to meet face to face in September 1840, Miller and Himes and others issued a call for a convention or general conference of Advent believers to meet in Himes' Chardon Street Chapel in Boston in October. Miller never made it to the meeting. Turned back home by typhoid fever, the meeting went on without him. One of the large disappointments of Miller's life in the early 40s was not being able to attend the first general conference of the Millerite Adventists. But Surprisingly enough, and perhaps maybe not surprisingly, the movement and the convention went on fine without Miller. Miller's absence from that general conference meant a couple of important things. One, it meant that there was more room for other leaders to move into the movement and take larger roles in the movement. And also, at the same time, it meant that the movement could be broader and less focused specifically on Miller himself. He would remain the spiritual head of the Millerite movement, but the organization, the philosophy, and the methodology of the movement now had grown beyond his need to be present. Our view on the near coming of the Lord in his kingdom is not a new doctrine. Sound Christians in every age have cherished it. It was the universal faith of the primitive church. It is the plain doctrine of the New Testament. Our object is to revive and restore the ancient faith to renew the ancient landmarks. Henry Dana Ward, a respected Episcopalian clergyman from New York City, chaired the first general conference. The Millerites assumed that the basically orthodox content of Miller's lectures would uh, attract a variety of people from throughout Protestantism. And the fact that Henry Dana Ward, an Episcopalian, was not only active but a leader of the movement suggested they were correct. The general conferences provided some structure and some organization to a movement that otherwise was somewhat amorphous. They provided focus through their moderators, their organization, their agendas, for example, for a movement that was quite broad and vague otherwise. The most joyful event that Miller could even imagine was the second coming of Jesus. 
he just naturally thought that all he had to do was just show people from the Bible and they would just accept it and that would be it. The whole world would come to a conclusion similar to his. On a January Sunday morning in 1841, Charles Fitch, pastor of the Union Evangelical Church in Haverhill, Massachusetts, invited the congregation to stay briefly after the service. He encouraged his parishioners to sign an abolition petition to Congress, being circulated by some members of his congregation. By Tuesday, more than 40 citizens of Haverhill, including more than a dozen from Fitch's church, had signed on. They sent the petition to John Quincy Adams, congressman from Massachusetts and former president of the United States. Adams introduced the petition in Congress a few days later and nearly ended his career. One Southern congressman called for burning the petition in the presence of the House. Another said Adams' treason ranked with Benedict Arnold and Aaron Burr. A third said Adams deserved to be expelled from office. Unlike the usual flood of petitions demanding or pleading that the government abolish slavery, this one simply asked Congress to abolish the Union. The Haverhill abolitionists maintained that the North's resources were being drained to support slavery, which they found repugnant. Thus, they claimed they wanted no more Union with the South. Charles Fitch, the Haverhill pastor, already had a national reputation as a bold abolitionist and powerful revival preacher. Charles Fitch had also become an ardent Millerite. As soon as I was ready to come out on the second advent, the door before me was thrown wide open, and I have been unable for the last eight months to meet even one half the calls which I have received. Charles Fitch. When they showed me the length of the tent pole they wanted, I was more astonished than ever. It was to be 55 feet high. Hiram Munger. It was the biggest tent in America, and Munger had just been hired to be the tent master. The novelty of the scene drove off my blues. I and others thought and said, where are all the people coming from to fill it? For it was estimated to hold 3,000 to 4,000. Hiram Munger. The tent filled easily. Second Advent camp meetings with or without benefit of the great tent immediately popped up all over the Northeast. More than 125 were held between 1841 and 1844, attended by hundreds of thousands of believers, scoffers, and the merely curious. An up-and-coming journalist and poet from Haverhill looked in on one of the gatherings. When I reached the ground, a hymn, the words of which I could not distinguish, was peeling through the dim aisles of the forest. To the imaginative mind, the scene was full of novel interest. The white circle of tents, the dim wood arches, the upturned earnest faces, the loud voices of the speakers burdened with the awful symbolic language of the Bible, the smoke from the fires rising like incense, carried me back to those days of primitive worship which tradition faintly whispers of when on hilltops and in the shade of the old woods, religion had her first altars, with every man for her priest and the whole universe for her temple. John Greenleaf Whittier. In November 1842, Himes and Miller spoke at a 10-day camp meeting in Newark, New Jersey. James Gordon Bennett, editor of the New York Herald, sent a reporter to attend the meetings across the river for the full run. Bennett ran the reporter's accounts daily in the Herald November 4th through 15th, and later printed the complete set as an extra. You can form no idea of the excitement this camp meeting has created in this very orderly and sober little town or city. It is the universal subject discussed here, the New York Herald. The spirit of lying is so prevalent that we shall, hereafter, devote a portion of our sheet to chronicle the deeds of our opponents. We shall publish their shame 
in their own words, in general, without note or comment. The signs of the times. In the early years of his preaching, Miller was generally treated with respect by those of the press who paid any attention at all. By 1841, the tone began to change. If the Almighty intended to give due notice of the world's destruction, he would not do it by sending a fat, illiterate old fellow to preach bad grammar and worse sense down in Jersey. New York plebeian. Newspaper editors could be really cruel in their treatment of William Miller and the Millerites. And editors were always looking for filler material to, to entice the readers and entertain them, and, and they picked on his size and his appearance, but they also charged that Miller had concocted this whole story just to make money out of the sale of his books. They called him an old humbug and a fool and, and very often suggested that he was just crazy. Elder Himes is a man with a mind in a nutshell, extremely weak in every point of light. We will try to muster charity to believe him sincere. To a sane man, he must be an object of pity. He is fat as an alderman and lives like a prince. We are informed he boards at the Astor House, where board is from $2 to $5 a day, according to how great a shine one makes. Editor Olive Branch. As calmly pointed out by a Millerite editor, Joshua Himes had never eaten a meal at the Astor House in his life. The Millerites not only had to deal with criticism from the secular press, but also from the religious press, which in that time was very influential. One of the most avid of those critics was misnamed the Olive Branch. And that journal called down upon Himes and Miller thunderbolts red with uncommon wrath. Beyond that, they just scourged Miller and Himes for duping the common people out of their money. As the months went by, the attacks mounted. The Millerites were often deliberately misrepresented. Stories were fabricated. One of the most common stories was that Millerites made themselves white ascension robes to prepare for the great day. A favorite kind of story about Millerites was, of course, the story about the ascension robes. These were supposed to be white robes that Millerites donned before they would go to some high spot to then wait for the coming of Christ. Uh, the stories would say things like the Millerite climbed a tree in his ascension robe or got on top of the hog pen in his ascension robe, something like that. Uh, very often the same story would appear in newspaper after newspaper with more detail being added as the story was repeated. Uh, perhaps it's important to make clear that there's no direct evidence of any Millerite actually wearing an ascension robe, but it made a wonderful story. While the ascension robe stories made good press, 20th century historians have proven them to be without foundation, although they were spread far and wide. Despite concerted efforts to avoid setting a date any more specific than about 1843, leaders of the Second Advent Movement were repeatedly embarrassed when some of their less stable and increasingly restless followers named exact dates. April 3rd was one such date, loudly proclaimed by some Millerites. Regarding the men of April 3rd, I would respectfully suggest that in some way or other, they have, in all probability, made a small mistake as to the exact day of the month when the grand catastrophe takes place. The 1st of April, being evidently much more appropriate to their arrangements than any other day in the year, Moses Stewart. In an effort to quell the mounting chaos on the fringes of his ranks, Miller, in late December, made a more specific statement and yet went no further than what he thought the scriptures could support. He based his view on the fact that the ancient Bible year began in the spring. I believe the time can be known by all who desire to understand and to be ready for his coming. And I am fully convinced that sometime between March 21st, 1843 and March 21st, 1844, Christ will come and bring all his saints with him, and that then he will reward every man as his work shall be. 
Dear brethren, this year, according to our faith, is the last year that Satan will reign in our earth. Let every one of us try, by persuasion, by the help and grace of God, to get one at least of our friends to come to Christ in this last year of redemption. William Miller On a January weekend in 1843, Pranksters scattered handbills around Washington, D.C., announcing that William Miller would speak from the steps of the U.S. Patent Office. Several thousand Washington, D.C. residents, including members of Congress, showed up. William Miller was in Bennington, Vermont. In fine, it was not a bad hoax. Pretty well got up. But if it had been on any other day than Sunday, it would have been better. Washington correspondent, Boston Mercantile Journal. In February of 1843, the nation was startled by the unexpected appearance of a new comet, so bright that it was visible in the daylight. Well, many Millerites look to natural phenomena as signs of the imminent approach of Jesus Christ and the end of the world. And it wasn't just the great comet that streaked across the sky in 1843. Millerites saw in the northern lights and eclipses and powerful thunderstorms evidence that, that Jesus was coming. And there were even very peculiar reports of, of events like a, a shower of, of meat and blood that apparently fell on Jersey City. And, and they were sure this was evidence that the world was coming to an end. To the Millerites, the confirming signs in the heavens as they saw them seemed reinforced by increasing abuse and opposition on Earth. The Millerites have very properly been shut out of the buildings in which they have for some time been holding their orgies in Philadelphia. After some dozen more deaths occur and a few more men and women are sent to madhouses by this miserable fanaticism, perhaps some grand jury may think it worthwhile to indict the vagabonds who are the cause of so much mischief. Brother Jonathan Magazine. Causes of insanity accepted in the 1840s included a long list of things, including Millerism to be sure, but also including religious excitement in general, domestic difficulties, other kinds of disturbances that in the 20th century would not be considered uh, legitimate explanations for people going insane. It seems to me that Millerite insanity has much more to do with the way that Millerites seem threatening to their neighbors and threatened disorder and disruption than having to do with insanity itself. Modern critical research has demonstrated beyond a shadow of a doubt that the wild claims about Millerite insanity are no more founded than are those on the Ascension Road. Prominent theologians wrote books and preached sermons attempting to refute Miller's ideas. Sometimes, in Miller's view, they did a credible job, even though he strongly disagreed. Other times, he had little sympathy for their efforts. I am sick of this continual harping upon words. Our learned critics have made more infidels in our world than all the heathen mythology in existence. What word in Revelation has not been turned, twisted, racked, rested, distorted, demolished, and annihilated by these voracious harpies in human shape until the public have become so bewildered that they know not what to believe? Horace Greeley, the 32-year-old editor of the powerful New York Tribune, took a personal interest in combating the teachings of the farmer preacher from Lowampton, New York, and Pulteney, Vermont. In March 1843, Greeley published a special two-page extra of the Tribune containing an elaborate attack on Miller's doctrine. Fifteen years earlier, as a teenager, Horace Greeley had worked as a printer's apprentice on the local newspaper in Pulteney, Vermont. Occasionally, a courageous editor would speak a word on the other side. The truth is, as we apprehend, that many of those who are so indecorous and vituperative in their denunciations of Miller are in fearful trepidation, lest the day being so near at hand should overtake them unawares. And hence, like cowardly boys in the dark, they make a great noise by way of keeping up their courage and to frighten away the bugbears. Pittsburgh Gazette. If Noah... Daniel and Job had reappeared in the person of Friend Miller, 
they would have been derided, slandered, misrepresented, and denounced as disturbers of the peace of the world's giddy dance, just as Mr. Miller and his party have been. Alexander Campbell. Campbell, no Millerite, was founder of the Disciples of Christ. The most conclusive argument that I have ever seen in favor of the soundness of Mr. Miller's theory is the bitterness with which it is assailed by a benighted and corrupt priesthood and the scoffs and jeers which it elicits from the profane rabble. Opposition from such sources usually affords strong corroborative proof of the excellence of the cause or doctrine which is held up to condemnation. The Liberator, February 10, 1843. Apparent sympathy from Garrison could have been only small comfort to Miller. The radical abolitionist editor was himself probably the most hated man in America. Miller's movement had grown spectacularly since his first big city lectures in 1839. In Philadelphia, New York, Washington, Rochester, Buffalo, and Cleveland, the faithful or simply curious, thousands at a time, throng the largest auditoriums available when Miller was in town. For the most part, his followers, when not attending a Second Advent meeting, continued to attend their own denominational churches. But they also wanted places where they could meet as believers in the Advent near. In Boston, Himes leased property on Howard Street and designed a large wooden structure with a brick facade. The building was dedicated on May 5, 1843. I expected to see a rough, uncouth affair, which would end, whether the world did or not, with a cause to which it owes its existence. But not so. I beheld a neat, spacious room capable of seating over 3,000 persons as a lecture room and house of prayer for at least one generation. The Christian Herald. Ezekiel Hale, a prosperous mill owner from Haverhill, Massachusetts, helped fund and build a Millerite meeting house in his hometown. When a passerby asked why he wasn't setting the post below the frost line, Hale replied that it wasn't necessary. Jesus was coming before the next hard frost. My heart was deeply pained during my tour east to see in some few of my former friends a proneness to wild and foolish extremes and vain delusions, such as working miracles, discerning of spirits, vague and loose views on sanctification. William Miller. The Millerites were really caught on the horns of a dilemma. On the one hand, Himes and Litch and other leaders of the movement worked hard to project a public impression of the Millerites as orthodox and sane Christians. But on the other hand, William Miller preached the doctrine that, that all people, not just clergy people, could interpret the scriptures for themselves in the light of the Holy Spirit. So on the one hand, you encourage people to interpret scriptures. On the other hand, you get people actually doing that. And the result was some people with very strange ideas coming into the movement who were very difficult to control. If Second Advent meetings must be the scenes of such disgraceful proceedings as I there witnessed, I protest against more being held. It would be better for the cause never to have another at such a price. Josiah Litch. Refuting scandalous inventions and denouncing real fanaticism were hard enough, but the most painful attacks for most Millerites were those that now came from their home churches. Resolved that the peculiarities of that theory relative to the second coming of Christ and the end of the world denominated Millerism are contrary to the standards of our church and are among the erroneous and strange doctrines which we are pledged to banish and drive away. Methodist Episcopal Conference, Bath, Maine. By 1843, a large number of ministers in Maine were preaching the imminent Second Advent, including more than 30 ministers from the Methodist Episcopal Church alone. At an annual statewide meeting held in Bath, church officials passed a ruling prohibiting their ministers from preaching the Second Advent doctrine on the penalty of heresy trials. 
Levi Stockman, a 31-year-old Methodist pastor in Portland, defied the ruling even while suffering the final ravages of tuberculosis. At his heresy trial, Stockman asked to be shown from the Bible how his belief in the Second Advent differed from Methodist doctrine. The church refused. But they did tell him that if he did not recant his belief in the Second Advent doctrine, that his family would be cut off from the funds set up for deceased Methodist ministers. Stockman stood firm. He died a few months later and is buried in an unmarked grave. Robert Harmon, the Portland hat maker and father of young Ellen, battled to keep his family's membership in the Chestnut Street Methodist Episcopal Church. Their pastor warned them to give up their Advent beliefs or quietly withdraw from fellowship. Harmon asked for a trial, insisting that the charges be specified, since the Advent doctrine was not contrary to Scripture or any published creed of the church. Instead, the elders called the Harmons, seven in all, to a small meeting in the church vestry. They vaguely claimed the Harmons walked contrary to the rules of the church and voted them out. My father, in his defense, received the blessing of God, and we all left the vestry with free spirits, happy in the consciousness of the approving smile of Jesus. Ellen Harmon. Millerites may often have been genuinely pushy in carrying their doctrines to their neighbors and fellow church members. After all, if you believe that Jesus Christ is about to break through the clouds, you are not going to be casual in passing that information on to your neighbors. The doors of most of the churches in our land have been closed against this doctrine. Pastors have boasted that their churches were free from it. Joshua Himes. But I do say, if you are a Christian, come out of Babylon. If you intend to be found a Christian when Christ appears, come out of Babylon and come out now. Charles Fitch. By the summer of 1843, many Millerites had had enough. Eager for fellowship in their home congregations, they nevertheless were tired of what they felt was constant harassment for their faith. In a ringing sermon in July, Charles Fitch answered their dilemma. Leave, and not just for comfort's sake, but for Jesus' sake. Fitch applied the biblical metaphor of Babylon, not just to Catholicism, as Protestants had for centuries, but all religious powers, Catholic or Protestant, who opposed the doctrine of the literal second coming of Christ. Where the book of Revelation in chapter 18 called God's people to come out of Babylon, Fitch heard the call to separate from the churches. September 28, 1843, to the Union Evangelical Church, Haverhill. Dear brethren, after much prayer, I have come to the conclusion that it is my duty as an individual who expects soon to see the Savior come in the clouds of heaven, to request my name, to be dropped from your book, and not to be considered as a member of this church after this day. I wish you to do it in a way that, in your judgment, shall tend most for the good of the cause of Christ without regard for my feelings. I expect soon to see Christ, who will be our King, and be with Him and you in the new earth, yours in the blessed hope of the glorious appearing of our Lord in 1843, Ezekiel Hale, Jr. Many Millerites, like Ezekiel Hale, answered Fitch's call and left their churches. William Miller wasn't one of them. I do not advise anyone to separate from the churches to which they may have belonged, unless their brethren cast them out or deny them religious privileges. By the fall of 1843, whether Millerites stayed in their churches or left, it didn't really matter. The year of the end, according to Miller's calculation, was rapidly drawing to a close. Christ could come at any moment, but not later than March 21, 1844. If Christ comes as we expect, we will sing the song of victory soon. 
If not, we will watch and pray and preach until he comes, for soon our time and all the prophetic days will have been filled. After a last whirlwind tour of lectures to huge crowds in Boston, New York, Philadelphia, Washington, and Baltimore, from late January to early March of 1844, William Miller went home to Lowhampton to wait for his savior. March 21 came and went. Lowhampton, March 25th, 1844. My dear brother Himes, the time as I have calculated it is now filled up, and I expect every moment to see the Savior descend from heaven. William Miller. In spite of the fact that Jesus hadn't come, the movement didn't collapse, largely because it had not been focused on a particular point of time, and that is, a particular day. Why should I complain if God should give a few days or even months more of probation time for some to find salvation and others to fill up the measure of their cup before they drink the dregs? In May 1844, Miller made his first public appearance since the failure of his prediction, addressing the delegates to the annual general conference at the Boston Tabernacle. The press showed up along with the faithful. I never heard him when he was more eloquent or animated, or more happy in communicating his feelings and sentiments to others. He confessed that he had been disappointed, but by no means discouraged or shaken in his faith in God's goodness, or in the entire fulfillment of his word, or in the speedy coming of our Savior. Boston Post. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it. The text is from the book of Habakkuk in the Old Testament. For the Second Advent believers, it became the explanation of their disappointment and the promise of their vindication. They were in the tearing time. I'm a pilgrim and I'm a stranger I can tarry, I can tarry but a night In Christ's parable of the wise and foolish virgins from which they drew their own metaphor of the midnight cry they saw that both the wise and foolish fell asleep while the bridegroom Christ tarried Meanwhile, America moved on. The country prepared for presidential elections in the fall. Henry Clay running for the Whigs and James K. Polk on the Democratic ticket. In the city of brotherly love, Protestants rioted when the school board allowed Catholic children to read from a Catholic version of the Bible. The mayhem lasted for days with cannons in the streets and churches burning. In Boston the same month, Reformed alcoholics and their friends gathered on the common for a huge rally of their temperance organization, the Washingtonian Society. In June, in Illinois, Joseph Smith, the controversial prophet to the Mormons, announced his candidacy for the U.S. presidency in the 1844 elections. Disorders followed. Smith was arrested and jailed. A mob of armed men stormed the jail and murdered Smith and his brother. Against this clamorous background, Millerite believers waited patiently for the day that would put an end to all of it. God is an exact timekeeper. And those types which were to be observed in the seventh month have yet to be fulfilled. Samuel Snow. Samuel Sheffield Snow had been a self-proclaimed infidel and sales agent for an atheist newspaper. In 1839, after reading William Miller's lecture, Snow was converted to the Christian faith and became a prominent Second Advent lecturer himself. 
After March 21st, 1844, the Millerite movement really lapsed into inactivity in many ways. They fell out of public view. Although Millerites kept on acting in the movement, they kept publishing the newspapers, held conferences and camp meetings throughout the North. But a great deal of excitement would come back into the Millerite movement when Samuel S. Snow delivered a very exciting message at the camp meeting at Exeter, New Hampshire. In late August 1844, at the Exeter camp meeting, Snow's declaration about the seventh month created a huge sensation among the Millerites. By the seventh month, Snow meant the seventh month of the ancient Jewish calendar. His detailed reasoning led to the conclusion that the cleansing of the sanctuary would occur on the Jewish Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, the tenth day of the seventh ancient Jewish month. That was just two short months ahead. Jesus would return on October 22, 1844. For many Millerites who saw themselves depicted so clearly in the parable of the wedding in Matthew 25, Snow's message marked the conclusion of the tearing time and the beginning at last of the true midnight cry. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. This thing has gone over the country like lightning. Nearly every lecturer has come into it and are preaching with zeal and great success. It has done away with all fanaticism. 1843 never made so great and good an impression as this has done upon all that have come under its influence. I dare not oppose it, although I do not yet get the light as to the month and the day. Joshua Himes. The original leaders of the Millerite movement were somewhat slow to come on board the seventh month movement. Once again, the movement, in a sense, had moved beyond the existing leadership. Himes, for one, moved toward accepting the October date only after he saw what he called the fruits of that date setting. And Miller, too, slowly came around to accepting the October 22, 1844 date. On the 6th of October, Himes dropped all his own reservations and announced his belief in October 22 as the Day of the Lord. At virtually the same moment, Miller was writing a letter to Himes. Dear Brother Himes, I see a glory in the seventh month, which I never saw before. Now, blessed be the name of the Lord, I see a beauty, a harmony, and an agreement in the scriptures, for which I have long prayed, but did not see until today. I am almost home. Glory, glory. William Miller. By the 15th of October, all the Millerite leaders were proclaiming the coming of the Lord in just seven more days. Charles Fitch, too, had accepted October 22. But his voice was now silent. In early October, the irrepressible Fitch had stopped to preach in Buffalo, New York, on his way home to Cleveland. While conducting three successive group baptisms in Lake Erie on a day with a stiff breeze, Fitch caught a bad chill. He turned feverish, and just eight days before the world would end, Charles Fitch died. A few weeks earlier, in a potato field in southern New Hampshire, Millerite Leonard Hastings faced a tough decision. Should he deny his faith in Jesus' immediate return by digging his potatoes to get him through a winter that would never come? But if, for some unthinkable reason, Jesus did not come, it would be a long, lean winter without those potatoes, which surely would rot before October 22. Hastings left them in the ground to rot, or, as he was sure, burn. In Haverhill, Massachusetts, Ezekiel Hale decided that when the end came, his savior shouldn't find him holding unnecessary property, like his prosperous woolen mill. Ezekiel's son, E.J.M. Hale, quickly volunteered to relieve his father of his burden. Most of E.J.M.'s siblings vigorously opposed the arrangement. They didn't trust their brother's motives, and they disputed his low valuation of their father's property. Ezekiel signed it over anyhow, mill and all. He spent the days ahead pleading with his friends and business associates in town to accept their loving Savior and avoid the fiery destruction about to fall. Ezekiel Hale was chief engineer of the Haverhill Fire Department. <laughs> 
there was a hat maker in Rochester, New York, and one day, a couple weeks before the October 22nd deadline, he opened up his shop and invited the public to come in and take all the hats that they wanted. This is the kind of story that posed a real dilemma for the Millerites. They were always trying to balance two conflicting needs. One was a need to give away, to sacrifice as an act of faith that Jesus Christ really was coming back soon. But on the other hand, the Millerites wanted to make sure that their people could take care of themselves, that they wouldn't become a burden until the time when Jesus did come back. It was a very difficult balance to maintain. On October 13, angry mobs in Boston forced Himes to close meetings at the Howard Street Tabernacle. The restless spirits of the community had been aroused. We could not meet in peace, and our meetings in consequence had been suspended. We forgive our enemies. They have not injured us. And oh, that they could see how much they have injured themselves. Joshua Himes. In the last two weeks, the sense of urgency became overwhelming. Himes ran presses 24 hours a day, turning out tons of leaflets and newspapers for last-minute distribution to persuade the wavering. Break loose from the world as much as possible. If indispensable duty calls you into the world for a moment, go as a man would run to do a piece of work in the rain. Run and hasten through it. Let your actions preach in the clearest tones. The Lord is coming. The time is short. This world passeth away. Prepare to meet thy God. The Midnight Cry, October 19, 1844. As the date of the present number of this paper is our last day of publication before the tenth day of the seventh month, we shall make no provision for issuing a paper for the week following. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him is the cry that is being sounded in our ears. And may we all, with our lamps trimmed and burning, be prepared for his glorious appearing. Joshua Himes. At last the day was upon them. There was nothing more to do. After the intense emotions of the past year, most Millerites were content to be at home with their families or in their meeting houses at the risk of disturbance by mobs. Miller retired to Lowhampton. Jane Marsh Parker remembered that her father, an influential Millerite editor, was so worn out by the stress of the past months that he could hardly rise from his pillow. He called us to his bedside, and after a short prayer, he sang, The last lovely morning, all blooming and fair, is fast onward fleeting, he now will appear. So on the great day, they waited quietly, thousands upon thousands, in homes and churches, some in open fields, straining to hear that first trumpet call, to catch that first beam of heavenly glory, to savor for eternity that first radiant smile on the face of their lovely Savior. But Jesus did not appear. We were still in this world. There had been no deliverance. Our Lord had not come. No words could express the feelings of disappointment of a true Adventist. Luther Boutel. Our fondest hopes and expectations were blasted. And such a spirit of weeping came over us as I never experienced before. It seemed that the loss of all earthly friends could have been no comparison. We wept and wept till the day dawn. I mused in my own heart, saying, My Advent experience has been the richest and brightest of all my Christian experience. If this had proved a failure... What was the rest of my Christian experience worth? Has the Bible proved a failure? Is there no God, no heaven, no golden home city, no paradise? <laughs> 
Is all this but a cunningly devised fable? Is there no reality to our fondest hope and expectation of these things? And thus we had something to grieve and weep over if all our fond hopes were lost. And as I said, we wept till the day dawn. Ira Nitzen. God has brought us through a most trying ordeal. We have seen and felt our own nothingness. We have found the grace of God sufficient to sustain us, even at such a time. While the unbelieving world treated us with contempt and scorn, even with violence, we have been enabled to endure this also, with uncomplaining patience. Joshua Himes. When Elder Himes visited Portland, Maine, a few days after the passing of the time, and stated that the brethren should prepare for another cold winter. My feelings were almost uncontrollable. I left the place of meeting and wept like a child. James White. I found about 70 believers in a large house, living there and having meetings daily. They had put all their money in a milk pan, and when they paid for anything, they took money from the pan. We held a meeting with them and advised them as best we could to keep the faith and separate, which advice they kindly took, each going to his or her calling. Luther Boutel. Millerism as a popular, highly visible ecumenical movement had come to an end. Among the thousand and one expositions of scripture which are every day being palmed upon us, some of them, at least, must be wrong. William Miller. Miller only slightly exaggerated when he vented his frustration to an emergency general conference that Himes called in Albany in 1845. To the conservative leaders of the movement, desperately trying to hold it together, it seemed there were as many bizarre explanations of what had gone wrong the previous October as there were people who still claimed to be Second Adventists, a number that dropped dramatically after October 1844. After the great disappointment of October 22nd, Millerites responded in a variety of ways. And people generally will respond in similar ways when something they fervently expect does not take place. There were at least three views that came to explain what actually took place on October 22. One way they responded was to say, well, the event was right, but we just got the date wrong. Another group argued that the second advent had in fact occurred, but it had not occurred physically as they had originally anticipated. Rather, it had occurred in the hearts of believers. In a sense, they argued that the second coming was a spiritual indwelling within people already on the earth. The third group of Millerites, that is the smallest group, held that Miller had indeed been right on the dating of the 2300 days. Something had happened on October 22, 1844. But the cleansing of the sanctuary this group held was not the second coming of Jesus. In Portland, Maine, 17-year-old Ellen Harmon reported that she had a vision in which she was told that Adventists should hold on to their faith in the midnight cry. The October 22 date was correct, she said, but it hadn't signified the second coming of Jesus. If they kept their faith in the prophecy, Jesus would see them through to heaven soon. In the years immediately following 1844, the majority of former Millerites formed two main organized groups, the Evangelical Adventist Association and the Advent Christian Church. Both vigorously opposed the tiny but growing number of other Adventists, including Ellen Harmon, who insisted that the Millerites were right about the date of 1844, but wrong about the event that was to take place then. This small group, upon re-examining and carefully studying their key Bible texts, 
came the conclusion that Jesus did not come out of the heavenly sanctuary on October 22 to return to the earth, but he'd actually entered into a second phase of his work on that day. By the late fall of 1844, newspapers in southern New Hampshire noted that farmers in the region were struggling to salvage harvested potatoes that were rotting in their bins from a strange new blight. After the devastating disappointment of October, Leonard Hastings finally gave in and dug his potatoes the following spring. His potatoes were blight-free. Hiram Munger continued as a camp meeting superintendent and became a stalwart Advent Christian minister. Ezekiel Hale, the Haverhill, Massachusetts fire engineer who gave away his woolen mill to his son, EJM, decided after October 22 that he wanted it back. EJM refused. Ezekiel sued. The celebrated case eventually went before an associate justice of the United States Supreme Court. Ezekiel Hale got his property back. By late summer of 1845, the Miller Tabernacle on Boston's Howard Street had been sold to a theater company. Two years later, after a fire, most of the structure was rebuilt as the Howard Athenaeum. By the 1920s, the old Howard, as it was affectionately known by Bostonians and sailors, had become one of the most famous burlesque houses in the Northeast. Samuel Sheffield Snow had, by 1845, decided that he himself was Elijah the prophet. In 1848, he promoted himself to premier of King Jesus. He died in 1889. In Portland, Maine, the 17-year-old Ellen Harmon, who had the vision encouraging Millerites to hold on to their faith, soon married James White, a minor Millerite lecturer from the nearby town of Palmyra. They traveled together to Advent meetings, James preaching the message and Ellen relating what she had been shown in several more visions. Together with a few others over the next few decades, they helped organize the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Ellen, whose visions continued until the end of her life, continually reminded her fellow believers of the validity of the Midnight Cry movement as a preparation for the imminent return of Jesus. She became recognized in the church as a prophet. A prolific writer, she authored more than 25 books on theology, health, and education, and wrote thousands of articles. She became in time the world's fourth most translated writer, ahead of Karl Marx, William Shakespeare, and Ernest Hemingway and behind Vladimir Lenin, Georges Simenon, and Leo Tolstoy. She died in 1915. Joshua Himes worked vigorously during the next three decades to hold the main body of Adventists together, first with the Evangelical Adventist and then with the Advent Christian Church. In 1879, at the age of 74 and worn out by a series of internal battles with church leadership, Himes rejoined the church of his childhood years and was ordained as an Episcopal priest assigned to the parish in Elk Point, South Dakota. Fifteen years later, suffering from terminal cancer, the 89-year-old Himes wrote to Ellen White, whom he had originally opposed but had come to respect. I may live a year or more, he wrote, but it will be great suffering. And so my last years will be very bad, but the morning will soon break and sickness, disease, and death will pass away forever. To the end, he remained a fervent believer in the return of his savior. He died on July 27, 1895. He was buried in a hillside cemetery in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, because he told his bishop, he wanted to be on top of a hill when Gabriel blows his trumpet. As for the reluctant preacher from Lowampton who had started it all, his Baptist church disfellowshipped him in January 1845 for continuing to believe that Jesus was coming soon. Miller held firmly to his faith, believing that there was simply an error of at most a few years in his calculation. He and other local Advent believers built a small chapel on his farm, the Baptist meeting house from which he was 
this fellowship disappeared in a few decades. Miller's little chapel still stands. After a slow decline in his health in the late 1840s, Miller died on Thursday, December 20, 1849, at the age of 67. They buried him in the small cemetery near his house. The inscription on the stone reads, at the time appointed, the end shall be. The Millerite movement and the great disappointment certainly made premillennialists more cautious than they might otherwise have been. The Millerite movement probably also helped postmillennialists become more optimistic, uh, more ebullient than they might otherwise have been. But the Millerite movement probably had other effects as well. One of the things that Millerism may have done is to help open up a major debate in the 19th century between those who wanted to emphasize the supernatural action of spiritual work and those who wanted to emphasize the imminence of spiritual work between those who believed that God worked by breaking through the clouds and those who believed that God worked through human agency and within society. By the middle of the 19th century, American Protestantism had become very intellectual. I think what the Millerites contributed to American Christianity was a process by which they rediscovered a God who was not only sovereign, but a God who was majestic, a God whose purpose was not predictable, a God who would approach us on the basis of his own purpose and not on the basis of human agendas. That's a contribution that the charismatic and the fundamentalist movements would build on in the late 19th and 20th centuries. Different people took different lessons from the Millerite experience. For some, it was the end of their interest in prophecy altogether. Others said, no, we must continue to look for Jesus to come in the clouds of heaven, but we will never set a specific day, a specific hour, or a specific time. And for many, it redirected their eyes to the heavenly sanctuary where they believed that Jesus was still ministering on their behalf. A century and a half after the 1844 Midnight Cry, Adventism continued through several religious organizations that traced some part of their heritage back to the preaching of the Lowampton farmer. Two small ones, the Church of God, Oregon, Illinois, and the Church of God, Seventh Day, each had about 6,000 members. The Advent Christian Church had prospered early and eventually established two colleges. As their doctrine gradually shifted away from the principles of William Miller's prophetic interpretation, they lost control of both institutions. Membership stood at 28,000, approximately the same as it had been 100 years before. The Seventh-day Adventist, originally the smallest of the Millerite groups in the 1840s, held firmly to the core of Miller's understanding of Bible prophecy. They argued that 1844 marked the beginning of a special judgment of God's remnant people just before the second coming. The remnant they defined as those who observed all of God's Ten Commandments, including keeping the seventh day as the Sabbath. A century and a half after 1844, Seventh-day Adventists counted more than eight million members worldwide and 850,000 in the United States, one out of every 300 Americans. They employed 128,000 workers and set up missions work in nearly every nation on the globe. And finally, William Miller wrote these words of hope. Brethren, although I have been twice disappointed, I am not yet cast down or discouraged. My mind is perfectly calm, and my hope in the coming of Christ is as strong as ever. Brethren, hold fast. Let no man take your crown. I have fixed my mind on another time, and here I mean to stand until God gives me more light, and that is today, today, and today, until he comes. <laughs> 
We have heard from the bright, the holy land. We have heard and our hearts are glad. For we were a lonely pilgrim band, and we Joy.